Welcome to the How to Learn Anything course from Plato University, where you're going to learn the science-based tools of pro learners to accelerate your learning, remember more, and master any hard skills. These are the secret techniques they didn't tell you in school. If you're passionate about changing your life with learning, join us at Plato.University to get exclusive content with every lesson. I'm your learning guide, Brandon Stover, and let's get started. All right, welcome to technique number 12, which is deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is going to be the real bread and butter of mastering any skill. Deliberate practice refers to a special type of practice that is purposeful and systematic. While regular practice might include mindless repetitions of something, deliberate practice requires focused attention and is conducted with a specific goal of improving your performance in a skill. Deliberate practice requires behaving in a specific way receiving feedback, which we'll cover in our next technique, and paying attention to what is different between the initial behavior and the feedback, and using the feedback to refine that behavior. It may seem a little counterintuitive, but it's best when you're doing this deliberate practice to actually be making errors. Only after you make an error can you receive the kind of feedback that will best improve your learning. Now, research by Anders Ericsson on deliberate practice has also shown that there are four elements that you need to actively engage in deliberate practice. Number one, a specific goal. Two, intense focus. Three, immediate feedback. And four, frequent discomfort by being at the edge of your abilities, which is also known as desirable difficulty. Now, one of my favorite examples of deliberate practice is discussed in the book Talent is Overrated by Geoff Colvin. In the book, Colvin describes how Benjamin Franklin used deliberate practice to improve his writing skills. When he was a teenager, Benjamin Franklin was criticized by his father for his poor writing abilities. Now, unlike most teenagers, young Ben took his father's advice seriously and vowed to improve his writing skills. He began by finding a publication written by some of the best authors of his time. Then, Benjamin Franklin went through each article line by line and wrote down the meaning of every single sentence. Next, he rewrote each article in his own words and then compared his version to the original version. As Benjamin Franklin described it, each time I discovered some of my faults and corrected them. Eventually, Benjamin Franklin realized his vocabulary held him back from better writing and so he focused intensely on that area. Deliberate practice always follows the same pattern. Break the overall process down into parts, identify your weaknesses, test new strategies for each section, and then integrate your learning into the overall process. Now, one of the reasons that deliberate practice works so well for helping us learn is because of something called desirable difficulty. For deliberate practice to be most effective, you need to venture outside your comfort zone. You need to push yourself to do something you find difficult and persist in trying and trying again and trying again in order to improve your skills. And this is exactly what desirable difficulty is. It's effortful, difficult learning which is deeper and more durable because the difficulty involved increases your retention. Learning with desirable difficulty often requires intense levels of concentration and perseverance, like struggling with a really hard problem that you think you have no hope in solving. And even though when you learn something, it can feel really good to practice the parts you know really well, and you might think that reviewing older and easier stuff will prevent your neural connections from being lost and withering away, but often when you push yourself to go deeper into the material, you're building on what you already know. In other words, even while you're building new connections, you're still practicing with the older ones. So if you want to advance quickly in your learning, you need to continue forming new connections in your long-term memory and not just reinforce the connections you already made. This means it's important to keep pushing yourself every day with harder material. But even in this definition and why it works, we can see this is going to be really hard and that's the point. So why should you use this if it's going to be so hard? Well, deliberate practice is not a comfortable activity. It requires sustained effort and concentration. The people who master the art of deliberate practice are committed to being lifelong learners, always exploring, experimenting, and refining their skills. And honestly, this is not a magic pill. But if you manage to maintain your focus and commitment, then the promise of deliberate practice is quite alluring to get the absolute most out of whatever you're learning. Now, every skill course at Plato University has you practice the skill as you learn it. For example, our How to Start a Podcast course has you practice podcasting skills the entire time. And these are crucial skills like recording a podcast episode or creating content outlines. 
which are practiced several times throughout the course. As you progress through the course, skills will get harder and more complex, adding on to the foundational ones you learned in the beginning and continuing to practice those all the way till the end. Now, how do you start applying deliberate practice in your learning? First, remember our elements of deliberate practice. You need to have a specific goal. What exactly are you practicing and why are you practicing this skill so that it adds up into the overall skill? The second element you need to have is intense focus. Remember, you want to set yourself up in an environment that has no distraction and allows you to focus in on what you're practicing. The third thing you want to do is set up a system for yourself to have immediate feedback. And we're going to go into that in just a moment. And lastly, remember you want to have that element of desirable difficulty and frequent discomfort at the edge of your abilities in that skill. So our first step in this process is figuring out what our goal is and what to focus on. Now here's a useful way for you to be able to determine what your goal is and what you should be practicing during deliberate practice. In chemistry, there's a useful concept known as rate determining step. This occurs when a reaction takes place over multiple steps with the products of one reaction becoming the reagents for another. The rate determining step is the slowest part of this chain of reactions, forming a bottleneck that ultimately defines the amount of time needed for the entire reaction to occur. Now we can use this concept of rate determining step inside of our learning process as well, where certain aspects of the learning problem is forming a bottleneck that controls the speed at which you can become more proficient at a skill. So when you're learning something, let's say playing the guitar, there may be a certain note that you're having a lot of trouble with, and so it's holding you up from being able to compose an entire song. This is the part of the skill that we're gonna want to practice because it's our hardest part in keeping everything else from being learned. But maybe you're not entirely sure what that rate determining step is, that one part of the skill that's holding you back from learning the rest. Well, you can take something called the direct then drill approach, which was presented by Scott Young in Ultra Learning. In this approach, the first thing that you're going to do is practice the skill that you're learning directly. So if we're learning how to play guitar and wanting to learn a certain song, then you're gonna directly practice that, especially if you're going to be playing out somewhere on stage or in front of people. So basically, Practicing directly means figuring out where and how the skill will be used and then trying to match that situation as close as feasibly possible when practicing. Other examples are like practicing a language by actually speaking it to other people, learning programming by writing software, or taking the approach that Benjamin Franklin did by learning writing by actually writing things. <laughs> what a concept. Now, when you're directly practicing this skill, the next step is to analyze the direct skill and try to isolate components that are either rate determining steps in your performance or sub skills you find difficult to improve because there are too many other things going on for you to focus on them. From here, you can develop drills to practice those components separately until you get better at them. And once you do get better at them, you can go back to the direct practice and integrate what you've learned from those drills. Now, when we're approaching the rate determining steps in learning, a powerful tool that we can use is drills. And this is where you separate that one step from the rest of the skill in order to practice it over and over again till you really master it. And the reason for this is that when you're practicing a complex skill, your cognitive resources, your attention, your memory, the effort that you're putting in must be spread over many different aspects of the task. And this can create a learning trap for you because in order to improve your performance in one aspect, you may need to devote so much attention to that one aspect that all the other parts of performance start to go down. But by doing specific drills, you can resolve this problem by simplifying a skill enough that you can focus your cognitive resources on a single aspect. So what we're gonna do in deliberate practice is actually practice two types of practice. We're gonna do direct practice and then we're gonna do drills. And we're gonna take both of these in alternating stages that form a larger cycle of learning with deliberate practice. So the first step is to actually practice the skill directly. When you're practicing this skill, you wanna receive feedback, which is typically an example of the correct or vastly better version of wh what you're trying to do. In some cases, the feedback may not be the correct version of the entire skill, but instead may zero in on a specific part that's incorrect, helping you to identify what needs improvement. And this is when you're going to want to take that piece and start practicing it in drills. Now, here's a few different strategies that you can use to create drills for yourself. And the first is time slicing. It's the easiest way to create a drill by isolating a slice in time in a longer sequence of actions. So if we return back to our playing guitar example, you can identify the hardest part of a piece of music and practice that until it's perfect before integrating it back into the entire song. 
Look for parts of the skill you're learning that can be decomposed into specific moments of time that have heightened difficulty or importance. Drill technique number two is cognitive components. Sometimes what you'll want to practice isn't a slice of time of a larger skill, but a particular cognitive component. For example, when you're speaking a new language, you gotta learn grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, all at the same time, but these are different cognitive aspects that you have to manage while you're speaking that language. The tactic here is to find a way to drill only one component. So maybe you just focus on grammar or pronunciation or the vocabulary of the language that you're studying. Drill technique number three is doing a copycat. And this is exactly what Benjamin Franklin did when he was learning to write. He found other authors and pieces of writing that he could actually copy and then start creating his own styles from. So for example, if you're practicing writing or maybe you're creating an artistic painting, you could take another creator and copy the parts of the skill that you don't want to drill and then focus exclusively on the component you want to practice. This saves you a lot of time because you're repeating only the part that you're drilling and it reduces your cognitive load, meaning you can apply more focus to getting better at that one aspect. Drill technique number four is the magnifying glass method. Let's say that when you're practicing something new, you have to do the entire process no matter what. For example, let's say you're baking a cake. It's really hard to separate out one part of that process and just bake that one part and still get a full cake. So with the magnifying glass method, you actually spend more time on one component of the skill than you would otherwise. Now this may reduce your overall performance or increase the amount of time that you need to work on the skill, but it will allow you to spend a much higher proportion of your time and cognitive resources on that single part that you need to master. Another drill that you can do is prerequisite chaining, which means actually trying to perform a skill that you don't have all the prerequisites for. Obviously, if you don't know how to do every aspect of this skill, you're gonna find out eventually that there's a few things you don't understand or know. But as those become apparent, you can go back and learn the foundations of the skill and then return back to performing the skill that you were trying to learn before and doing it much more successfully. For example, let's say you're creating a new piece of artwork, but maybe you really struggle with colors. So something foundational in the skill that you need to go back and learn is color theory. Once you learn this, you can return back to the skill of painting, applying what you've learned in color theory and doing much better in the new skill. Once you've practiced your drills and gotten really good at that one specific part of the skill, you then integrate it back into the hole and go back to practicing directly, integrating what you've just now learned in your drills. Now this doesn't have to be a long and drawn out thing when doing this direct practice to drill back to direct practice cycle. Instead, you can do these things even in the same learning session. As you start to approach mastery of a skill, your time may end up focused most directly on drills, as your knowledge of the complex skill breaks down into individual components, becomes more refined and accurate, and improving any individual component gets harder and harder. Now, a crucial component of deliberate practice that we mentioned during this process was getting feedback during the process. And that's the technique that we're going to cover next. Thank you for taking the How to Learn Anything course. To get everything you need to become a pro learner, including advanced resources, personal coaching, and a community of passionate learners just like you, then visit plato.university slash courses slash learning and join us for free. Again, that's plato.university slash courses slash learning. This course was produced by Plato University, where students turn passions into purpose and learn skills to change the world. Learn more at plato.university.